from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Mr. President, Dr. Kissinger, members of the cabinet, both of Mexico and America, Congress, members of Congress, ladies and gentlemen, we are honored that President Felipe Calderon of Mexico is with us to deliver tonight's Kissinger Lecture. This is something previously given at the Library of Congress only by former American Secretaries of State and alternatively by former heads of a foreign state or government. Dr. Kissinger delivered the first of these lectures and his friends and supporters who have made this event uh, possible. President Calderon is the first sitting head of state to deliver this unique international lecture here on Capitol Hill. And we are deeply grateful that he's found time to fit this into his exceptionally busy presidency. He has also graciously offered to answer questions and the audience may submit them succinctly in writing uh, to the ushers for our associate librarian for library services, Roberta Schaefer, to pose at the end of his talk. In a modest way, we in this, the oldest federal cultural institution in the United States, have been trying to help honor the past of our far older Mexican neighbor. We have preserved and made accessible more than 13 million Latin American items of all sorts in our collections, the oldest special reading room, and one of our two largest permanent exhibits in this building are centered on Mexico, and we are cooperating with leading Mexican institutions to virtually repatriate online the hitherto widely scattered magnificent codices that tell the story of early Mexico. President Calderon is a statesman for deep democratic values and a positive vision for the future of Mexico. He has been in our present time the builder of bridges between the past and the future of a great people. He has dramatically expanded both education at all levels and popular access to health care throughout his country within, at the same time, successfully navigating a growing economy through a difficult period. Mr. President, we admire your courage in campaigning to strengthen human security and the rule of law. You have helped develop unprecedented levels of cooperation and shared responsibilities between your country and ours. You symbolize and you have strengthened the uplifting aspirations of our good neighbors to the South. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome a great American, North and South, the President of Mexico, Felipe Calderon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. James Billington, Librarian of, the Cong of Congress, Dr. Henry Kissinger, former Secretary of State of the United States, honorable members of Congress, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor to be with you in this magnificent Library of Congress, a symbol of knowledge and wisdom. I would like to express my deep gratitude to James Billington, the Librarian of Congress, and to the members of the Kissinger Chair Steering Committee for this extraordinary opportunity. And of course, thank you, Dr. Kissinger, for being with us tonight. Thank you, Madame Lagarde, Managing Dire Director of IMF, Thank you, Secretary Janet Napolitano. Thanks, all of you. The world we live in 
faces unprecedented global challenges, very different from those Henry Kissinger saw in his time as Secretary of State. Back then, we had a world order marked by the Cold War and information about places far away was scarce. Internet and cell phones did not exist and computers were a privilege granted to a handful of scientists, big corporations, and some government agencies. Today, not only has the Berlin Wall fallen, signaling the end of a new era, but there has also been a revolution in telecommunications. Computers are now everywhere and the internet has shortened distances between people. Environmental awareness is widespread as it has been proved that climate change is a clear and present danger. Ice at the Earth's poles and snow on mountains are melting and the sea level is, is rising and if anyone ever doubted that we are all passengers on the same ship, it is now an uncontestable fact. Nations are becoming more interdependent. Individual actions and omissions generate universal impacts with consequences for everyone. Some of the oldest challenges, like hunger and poverty, persist. Others such as the Cold War, have disappeared, and new challenges have arisen, arise, such as terrorism, organized crime, or climate change. The world today is a complex organism in which all nations are interlinked. As Marshall McLuhan pointed out, the human family now exists under conditions of a global village. To our extended senses, we experience events as far away as the other side of the world, as if we were there in the same physical space. This new world needs a new order. This implies the building of a new model of global governance, more inclusive and more democratic. But above all, it demands clear and responsible leadership according to the times and according to the capabilities of each nation. And without a doubt, the United States has a lot to contribute in this regard. Global challenges require redefining the very concept of national interest. This new global reality shapes national interest and thus, it is in the national interest to address global challenges. Failing to understand this reality will mean that leaders and legislators around the world keep making mistakes, omissions, and irresponsible decisions with fatal consequences. I will address tonight some of these issues from the point of view of an emerging economy by sharing with you Mexico's recent experience and global responsibility. Let me begin with the issue of the global economy. A major power shift is underway. The Western economies, once centers of economic power, are now at the epicenter of the crisis. Emerging economies are becoming the new drivers of growth. This year, Mexico chaired the G20 in a most challenging context. The main source of concern is still the Eurozone crisis, and we still lack a definite solution despite months of trying. Restoring economic stability and growth has become the main priority of the G20 agenda. A lesson we learned from past crises in Latin America is that getting an economic back on track 
demands strong and decisive international responses to recover credibility and confidence. And the key is to recover confidence. That is the name of the game. The key is to recover confidence by stabilizing expectations, because the problem is that uh, the loss of confidence is immediate, but recovering it takes really hard work. So in order to deal with this, with confidence, it is crucial to carry out a diagnosis that is both honest and credible for the people in each country, to speak clearly about the costs and to make sure that the adjustment is large enough and implemented in a rapid and a bold fashion. This is when external support and international cooperation become crucial. Learning from our experiences, we must provide credibility to countries with confidence problems, as is the case of some of the most important European economies today. In addition to credible and bold policy adjustment, it is necessary to create a firewall to prevent the spread of panic and protect countries that are solvent but lack liquidity, which is the case of Italy or Spain. And to evaluate how much progress we are making in this, let me tell you that just in December 2011, we faced high levels of market volatility, significant erosion of confidence and expectations of near future economic stress all mainly associated with the debt crisis in Europe. The G20's agenda established as one of its key priorities to improve the international financial architecture. This could be attained by expanding the global financial resources available for crisis prevention and resolutions, in particular through the IMF. In January, while in Davos, we pointed out that the firewall, more than the source of money itself, is a source of confidence. The paradox is the following. The more money you put in the firewall, the more confidence you create. And the more confidence you create, the less money you will need to use. So the conclusion is, the more money you commit, the less money you spend. But the opposite is also true. The less money you put into the firewall, and the more you hesitate and delay the solution, the more money it will cost for everyone. European countries delivered recently on their commitments and made a very relevant effort in this direction last month. And last Friday, here in Washington, through the G20 process, together with the IMF, we secure firm commitments to increase by over $430 billion the resources made available to IMF. To put this in perspective, the amount will double the fund current available lending capacity. And this is especially noteworthy if we consider that the United States is not participating in this effort by first time. I would like to emphasize why I believe the agreement last Friday is relevant beyond simply the amount of resources committed. First, the agreement was rich and made possible due to different policy actions undertaken and committed by different countries. Second, the resources were committed by countries from all continents and regions, G20 and non-G20 countries, emerging and developed countries. Third, even those countries that are not committing resources, at least formally, they have found ways to support stability and growth through other means. Taken together, 
These are the elements that give context and meaning to, to the over $430 billion committed to the IMF. The relevance goes beyond simple numbers and into the process and policy action that made possible the broad support behind this successful outcome. Nonetheless, recovering global economic stability is only one part of the equation. The other part is restoring economic growth. And there are various ways to do this. One, promote structural reforms to improve the competitiveness of our economies and the productivity of them. Two, strengthen trade and global trade. It is easy to forget that trade brings benefits to everyone. Trade is able to generate growth and employment. Consumers win, workers win, producers win, businesses win. We all win. In Mexico, we strongly believe in economic freedom, in free trade and free investment as effective ways to promote economic growth, employment, and prosperity. Since 1994, we have been a dynamic part of NAFTA, an initiative that Henry Kissinger has correctly described as the most innovative American policy toward Latin America in history. Indeed, NAFTA has changed Mexico for good. Before NAFTA, for instance, Mexico's total export were $50 billion per year. Last year, they reached $350 million on exports. So today, Mexico is exporting more manufactured goods than all the other nations, including Brazil, in Latin America combined. And every year, Mexican buys more American goods than Japan or China together. Mexico is the second largest importer of American products in the world. And our market share in the United States has been rise, rising from 10% of imports in 2005 to almost 13% last year. Free trade has made our economy more competitive and stronger. I believe that free trade explains why Mexico has been able to weather the global economic storm much better than anyone expected. Three, investing in infrastructure in developed and above all in developing countries. Infrastructure projects create jobs in the short and in the long run, promote regional growth and improve competitiveness. I know that we need a lot of money, but the good news is that there is a huge availability of private funding. In the, that is the case of the pension funds, sovereign funds, or insurance funds. They are looking for long-term profitable investments, and that is precisely what infrastructure projects are. Long-term, profitable, and of course, absolutely sure. What we need today in order to promote infrastructure is to have financially and technically viable projects, and of course, a great deal of legal certainty for investors. That is why policies based on nationalism, statism, or expropriation are so damaging because they scare off any investment. And if we are able to match long-term liabilities, which is the case of retirement pension obligations, with long-term assets, such as investment in infrastructure, highways, and others, we will have a perfect formula to restart economic growth. When I started my term, in 2006, public and private investment in infrastructure in Mexico represented around 
3% of GDP per year, which is more or less the average in OECD. Today, we are investing at unprecedented levels of around 5% of GDP, something that has helped our country in difficult times. In short, global economy recovery depends on more trade, more investment, and more economic freedom, and not less. Finding a way out of the economic crisis is now the most pressing concern for governments and firms. But this should not make us neglect the problems that affect the entire world. That is why that is why Mexico included other global issues as top priorities for the G20. One is food security. For Mexico, it is essential that the G20 addresses the terrible misery in which billions of people live today. Food security is an issue that we want in the international spotlight. The poorest families in the world allocate half of their income to food. However, food prices have more than doubled in the last decade and this alone has led to a dramatic increase in global poverty around the world. And this has, this has had not only economic or social impacts, but also political consequences. For instance, some journalists or conventional wisdom suggest that the use of social networks like Twitter or Facebook was the driving force behind, behind the Arab Spring. In my opinion, however, what really took people to the streets was breath. The price of wheat more than doubled in the six months prior to the most significant demonstrations in the north of Africa. And you can check it out. The causes of the dramatic increase in food prices are not impossible to address. Yes, we understand that several economies are growing and the global demand for commodities, food included, are growing as well. However, we can and we must do something about climate change to protect our crops and we can and we must invest in agricultural technology to increase food production. And we can, and we must put an end to financial speculations in the commodity markets, which is affecting the living conditions for millions around the world. It is also essential that we can increase healthcare investment in social protection. Healthcare insurance is vital for low-income families to escape the poverty trap. Now in Mexico, after tremendous effort, thanks to a program called Seguro Popular or Popular Insurance, and thanks to a budget effort in order to build more than 1,000 new hospitals or clinics and rebuild more than 2,000 additional hospitals or clinics in Mexico, our country are reaching universal health care coverage, which is a goal that has not been reached in some of the most highly developed nations. So we are reaching the goal in which there will be a doctor, a hospital, a treatment, and medicine for any single, any single Mexican person. The last priority in our G20 agenda is addressing climate change and promoting green growth. The potential economic consequences of climate change in the following decades are going to compromise the future of mankind. And here is another example of how Mexico understood the common global good 
as part of our national interest. Climate change is affecting the whole planet. Climate change is provoking, for instance, snowing in April in Washington, D.C. It's provoking the most terrible drought in Mexico ever, and the most terrible drought in Texas and the middle part in the United States ever, 180 years. And terrible floods, the same in Mexico and Tabasco that in other parts of the world. And as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has shown, if we don't invest today in order to mitigate climate change, it will cost us several times more in the future to adapt to its fatal consequences tomorrow. Each country must do its part under the principle of common but differentiated responsibility. That is why, for instance, we put forward a national climate change strategy, the first among developing countries with specific emission reduction goals. The COP16 meeting that Mexico hosted in 2010 in Cancun was a milestone in the global fight against climate change. The agreements reached in Cancun were an important step towards more effective international climate finance mechanism, such as the Green Climate Fund, a Mexican proposal to channel resources to adaptations and mitigation measures around the world. The key for further progress lies in breaking down the false dilemma between economic growth and environmental protection. These are not mutually exclusive goals. On the contrary, they reinforce and complement each other. The key is finding all those public policies that make economic growth compatible with respect for the environment and ensuring that environmental protection does not hamper economic growth. Furthermore, sustainability even could be profitable in many environmental projects. And the key is to find out what, or what are those projects that have a positive net present value. And there are a lot of projects that are friendly, environmental friendly, and very profitable, very profitable at, at the same time. So part of the key lies in making sustainability profitable. And finally, there is another global challenge that is a priority for Mexico, although it is not part of the G20 agenda. I'm talking about the threat of organized crime. During the second half of the 20th century, the international security agenda was dominated by the Cold War, which could even have involved nuclear weapons in the conflicts between two big countries. In this century, armed confrontation between nation states has given way to issues such as terrorism and organized crime as the most important sources of concern, uncertainty, and instability. Criminal empires have not only expanded in financial and geographical terms, they have also built sophisticated networks of illegal activities around the globe. One single criminal organization can control methamphetamines production in Los Angeles and drug distributions in Madrid arms smuggling in El Paso, and extortion in Ciudad Juarez, just crossing the river. Car theft in Guatemala, and stolen car sales in Estonia. Kidnapping in Nigeria, and money laundering in Panama. So for these organizations, borders are just lines on a map. Organized crime, it's a global problem that erodes democratic institutions and wears down citizens' confidence. 
it tears apart the social fabric and hampers economic development. It substitutes the rule of law with the rule of fear. Organized crime is a threat to freedom and justice and a terrible destructive force. Organized crime is the perfect enemy of the rule of law. By building its networks of drug trafficking and distribution, it fights to control territories and take the place of the state. If, by definition, the state has the monopoly of law and law enforcement, the monopoly of public force, and the monopoly of tax collection, organized crime defies the state as it tries to impose its own laws, establish its own armed forces, and collect taxes via extortion. Mexico and in other countries in Latin America for years, criminal organizations were allowed to grow and strengthen to a degree that in some parts or towns in the country, local authorities were enabled to deal with them. Now, we are facing them with a holistic strategy that has three main components. First, frontal combat of the criminals. Second, rebuilding of law enforcement and justice institutions. And third, restoring the social fabric. We started a complete overhaul of law enforcement agencies and institutions and building up a new generation of police forces at federal level. We also launched a historical reform of the judicial system, and we are moving to a justice system based on oral trials, just like the ones you have here in the United States. And of course, we are also tackling the social causes of crime by investing heavily in education and health, opening re rehabilitation centers for addicts, especially for young people and teenagers, taking back public spaces for our communities and making schools safe for our children. For example, in five years, Mexico built 105 new public and tuition-free universities and 52 new campuses for existing institutions. And today, 120,000 engineers graduate from college every year more engineers graduating every year than in Germany or United Kingdom or Canada or Brazil or several countries. That, of course, is improving the competitiveness of the economy as well. In sum, we have a comprehensive strategy to address the roots of public insecurity in Mexico. Some examples of how this comprehensive strategy works are, for instance, the cities of Tijuana and, to a lesser extent, Ciudad Juarez. As you probably know, these border cities have been severely affected by criminal violence in recent years. To tackle this situation, we did not only send in the Army and the Federal Police, we also deployed an unprecedented amount of resources to restore the social fabric, giving thousands of scholarships to students, building hospitals and daycare centers, providing cash transfer to the poorest families, and opening new parks, community centers, and schools in once neglected neighborhoods. And now, Tijuana is making a tremendous comeback, and Ciudad Juarez is going in the same direction as both cities register a decline in violent crime. Since 2010, homicides have gone down 40% in Tijuana and 70% in Ciudad Juarez. Investment keeps coming, jobs are being created, and new opportunities are available for their people. I have to say, that Mexico has not been alone in this effort for security. We have found in the United States a spirit of renewed cooperation to face common problems under the principles of co-responsibility. But there is no doubt that 
much more must be done, particularly when it comes to dismantling the financial operations of criminal organizations in the U.S. and reducing American demand for drugs. Money. Money is what gives criminal organizations their ability to corrupt and to arm themselves to the teeth. And no country can face this problem by itself alone, especially in the case of small countries like Caribbean and Central American nations. We need to have a coordinated and bold initiative to get to the root of this problem, which is in the increasing demand for legal drugs in the United States. And as long as this market continues growing, money will keep flowing to the pockets of the crime lords. We need to either find a way to significantly reduce illicit drug in the U.S. market, the demand, or if this is not possible, alternative solutions to reduce the massive profits of criminal organization must be considered. Cutting this flow of money is key for this strategy to succeed. And there is another problem that has become vital for the security of Mexico and many other nations, halting the uncontrolled sale of assault weapons to criminal organizations. In the last five years, my government seized more than 140,000 guns and weapons from the criminals. 90% of them were sold in American gun shop. One of the key factors that give criminals organization their strength is the almost unlimited access to assault weapons in the United States. For Mexico, it is absolutely unfair and offensive that so many, li so many lives are lost because of this business, whose finally the only purpose is to fuel, to fuel the profits of one industry. There is clear evidence that when there is a sudden increase in the availability of weapons in a country or a region, the same in Africa after a civil war or in El Salvador after the guerrilla, as happened, for instance, in those countries or in the East Europe after the Civil War and other examples, this new availability of weapons generates an increase in violence levels. The lifting of the assault weapons ban in 2004, the year in which this law expired, has had a similar impact in Mexico and other Latin American nations. In short, organized crime is yet another example of an international challenge that requires a new approach, one based on each country assuming its responsibility and doing its part. Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, as we have seen in all of these examples, people's lives are increasingly affected by events taking place far from home. Far from home. That is the new global reality. Countries can no longer shape their fate in isolation. The days when Churchill, Stalin, and Roosevelt could meet in Yalta and determine the destiny of the world are long gone. Increasingly, some of the biggest problems facing people today are global in origin, and the only possible solutions are to be found in a new set of international arrangements under a new form of global governance. These arrangements will have to be more inclusive, more democratic, and reflect the growing importance of, of emerging economies and nations. Mexico is contributing to this goal my country is assuming its place in the world by taking on its international responsibility and by working with the community of nations to build lasting solutions to the great global challenges of our time. The same in the economic field with the G20 
or in environmental issues with the COP16 or fighting against organized crime and establishing international cooperation in that field. This also, all these challenges, also demands a new kind of international leadership. One that is willing to promote profound transformations. One that is willing to face problems head on. One that is committed to promoting inclusion and collaborative solutions. In this context, the United States, as one of the major players in world affairs, has a defining role to play. It should reassume its leadership in global issues. Since 9-11, we have seen American foreign policy dominated by the war on terror. We all understand that this is a major concern for this country and for the world. It is for every free nation on the planet. However, U.S. leadership on many other important issues seems to be missing. For instance, the U.S. has overlooked its relationship with Latin America, where it has a great potential for good in crucial areas such as development, trade, natural resources, investment, or security, to say some of them. And after more than a decade of wake, a weak engagement, the United States is faced with a Latin, a Latin America that is increasingly opposed ideologically, where anti-American feelings are growing by political interests in the region. This is a state of affairs that benefits nobody. Latin American countries need the United States for its development and modernization, and the United States needs Latin American countries because we are your natural allies and partners. The world also needs an America involved in environmental issues. The world needs an America committed to combating poverty and hunger. The world needs an America leading efforts against transnational organized crime. The world needs an America fixing not only its own economic problems, but the global economic problems. The United States needs to reinforce its historical role as promoter of democracy, freedom, and progress around the world. As Dr. Henry Kissinger once wrote, an America that confines itself to the refinement of its domestic virtues will, in the end, abdicate America's security and prosperity to decisions made by other societies in faraway places. Today, not only does the United States need the world more than ever, but the world more than ever needs a fully committed United States. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful talk. Mr. President, um, I'm going to mediate the questions. And um, if you have a question, one of our ushers will bring you a piece of paper and a pencil. But I'll start with one myself. Or, or we went to directly, if you, if you allowed it. Or. You prefer direct questions? OK. Well, while they're uh, going then through the audience, let me just ask you a, a very uh, easy question, I hope. <laughs> what are your immediate and then longer-term post-presidential plans? 
I don't know. I don't know. I'm trying to think about my term. There are several very long months in which I need to, to be focused. But after that, first, I will be with my family more than ever, I suppose, and I hope. I will rest some days, at least in December. And after that, well, I will work. So, uh, I mean, uh, I suppose that I will participate in the private sector as a lawyer or advisor or consulting or economist. Probably I will write. I want to write a lot. I will read. And possible, probably I will researching or teaching. I don't know. I have uh, some projects, but uh, I will tell you later, probably in December. <laughs> okay, the next question coming from the audience. Your presidency has been marked by many examples of Mexico taking leadership roles in a number of areas, environmental regulation, regional economic development, legal reform, and a leadership role in international relations within our hemisphere. Can you comment on your role and goals for relations with Cuba and Venezuela? Well, I need to say that uh, people of Cuba and people of Mexico are very close to each other. We have more or less the same history. We talk the same language. Uh, we like the same music. We share the same beautiful Caribbean Sea. So our policy is to, to be friend of any nation, especially with our neighbors and brothers. And that is the case of Cuba. However, I do believe in principles. I do believe in democracy, in human rights protection, in freedom. And I want to see sooner or later a Cuba in which those principles could live among the people. And the way to do that could be a very controversial matter. I know that this nation believes that, for instance, the economic boycott is a useful instrument to do so. I disagree on that. Probably the, when Fidel Castro took office, you know, well, I, I was born after Fidel Castro took office. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't know how, how, many, how many years has this uh, embargo but uh, I think it's not very useful, not yet. So I do believe that we need to do a lot of diplomacy. Uh, we need to do a lot of information. And we need to strengthen relationship, but at the same time to strengthen the fight for principle. And we need to remember the principles in which we stand for. So that is, moral, that is the the foreign relation policy of Mexico, to have clear relationship with Cuba and any other country, to stand for principles, there is no contradiction on that, and of course, to promote human values in which we believe, and expecting that international coordination, and of course, the willingness of uh, Cuban people, Cuban people could one day, I hope soon, uh, establish full rights and full democracy and full freedom in that country. One of the four pillars of the Merida Initiative addresses a need to institutionalize the rule of law. As a trained lawyer, this no doubt has special appeal to you. Please give us an update on where things stand now 
particularly how things are working with state and local governments in Mexico? Well, the, the pillars of Merida Initiative is the principle of co-responsibility. We are passing from the age of mistrust and lack of confidence for, to, towards one age of uh, full cooperation and disclosure between both countries. We pass from the age of finger pointing each other to the age of co-responsibility. Um, the principles of uh, Merida Initiative are very close to the axis of our strategy I mentioned already. One is fighting criminals, fighting them really hard. For instance, we published, the Attorney General Office published a list of the 37 most wanted criminals in 2009, and today we have seized 22, actually 23. Last Friday we catched the number 23rd, so, uh, so the list is 23 right now. Uh, Second is, and probably is the, the, what the American authorities I, are emphasizing, and I agree with that, is to rebuild law enforcement agencies and institutions. And for instance, one of the most important things probably we are doing is to rebuild federal police. When I took office, there was a very small corp, almost 5,000, almost 6,000 policemen. Most of them were highways patrol. They were not formed for law enforcement, actually. So we started to recruit young people, a lot of, uh, for instance, people coming from the universities, uh, to say that uh, we created a new intelligence area, information and intelligence area in the federal police. And now there are 11,000 graduated people young people working, not in the corner, not in the patrol, in the vehicle. They are working in the computer, uh, searching and making intelligence, which is, has been amazing for the successful of federal police. I can say that we have, thanks to the Merida Initiative, but also thanks to our own effort, the state of the art in terms of technology prosecuting criminals. We are building a very big database, which it has right now like 500 million data uh, in order to build one single, uh, uh, es el sistema único de información criminal, uh, crime information, one single crime information system. And it has been very useful for us. And the third is to reveal social fabric, as I said, through opportunities for young people, through study opportunities, universities, health opportunities, uh, uh, sports and recreation opportunities. For instance, we, we are not uh, municipal authorities, of course, but we have rebuilt like 5,000 public spaces. So you can see a corner in one neighborhood. So we are building there, for instance, soccer fields, are, um, which is, uh, I like so much. Um, actually, we organized the biggest soccer championship in the world last year. I can't remember the number, the number of teams, but uh, probably several thousand of them participated. So that's more or less the idea. And talking about the levels of government, the problem Mexico has, in my opinion, is there is a lack of enforcement between federal and local levels. We can do a lot and the local levels will do nothing, and nothing happened in legal terms. For instance, in several countries, they have one central and vertical police force, which is the case, for instance, in Colombia. Colombia, there is a Policia Nacional. So General Naranjo, a very brave man, he is able to appoint or remove any single person at the national police. However, if I know, as I know, that there is a policeman in a corner who is receiving bribes from the criminals, uh, me as president, I have not 
the legal capability to remove that policeman. At least I have some judicial evidence and uh, a too complicated process to do so. So that is part of the problem. We have uh, one single level at federal, the federal level, 32 state uh, governments and police corps, and more than 1,000 municipal police corps. And with that, it's really difficult to do very coordinated action. And there is some kind of moral hazard, because as long there is a strong and bold intervention of the federal level in a local situation, and it could be Juarez or Tijuana or Acapulco or La Laguna or Veracruz or Monterrey or Tamaulipas, for the local authorities, there, there is some kind of moral hazard because they don't need to rebuild their own institution. Why? Because there are the federal police. And the one single purpose that a lot of people say, ah, oh, the solution is call for the military, call for the army, call for federal forces. Yes, a lot of them used to criticize my strategy. But at this, that is in the morning, but in the afternoon, they used to call for more federal support. That is, this, um, it's a little bit ambiguous, the responsibility, we need to fix that, and we need to, to build new legal mechanism in order to assign the responsibilities on their fair places and the political costs on their fair places as well. Fair basis. Our last question. What would you like your legacy to be in Mexican history? How would you like history to remember you? That is difficult to say that, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I want to be remembered like a congruent man, a man on principles and values, and a man who believes in Mexico and loves Mexico so much. And of course, some of the, I cannot talk a lot about the legacy because uh, probably the, the purpose of the electoral law is that uh, the president don't say anything about achievements or legacy, but uh, <laughs> I think there are a lot of things that uh, could be very important for the country in this, in this era. Universal health coverage is one. The reductions on, of the rate of deforestation, the increase in the rate of uh, treatment of used water, uh, environmental purposes, the increase of engineers graduating every year. And probably most of the people will be remembered these years associated with, with the violence and crime. But the point is, I do believe that uh, life or providence, whatever you prefer, decide to put the right people in the right time. Uh, what I'm sure is that a lot of liabilities in this uh, aspect, in the, in the aspect of uh, crime, for instance, one liability clearly was the lack of a strong law enforcement institution and police corps. That will be in the future a very important asset for Mexico. And that, that will be part of this crucial era in which we live. I needed to face a lot of challenges, some of them were absolutely unexpected at the beginning of my administration. For instance, in 2006, nobody, no one expected to have the worst crisis that the present generations remember. It's easy to say the worst crisis, economic crisis after the crisis of 29, but uh, very few people remember that crisis. Uh, I needed to deal with the, the violence of the crime do new factors we are seeing, and it's not only Mexico, we can see the whole region of Latin America. Because we have a problem, yes, in terms of violence and homicides, but for instance, the rate of homicides in Mexico is like 18 homicides per 100,000 people, which is high. But you can see that in Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, the rate of homicides is above 50, which is very close to the rate of homicides in Imagine one state in the Caribbean Sea, Puerto Rico, an American state, almost 50. Uh, Jamaica is 72. Uh, other nations in the region are really high. Even Colombia, with this 
amazing, uh, amazing work made by the President Uribe, who reduced a lot violence. Actually, Colombia has today 34 homicides per 100,000 people. Or Brazil has 23, 24, with some cities like Rio de Janeiro with more than 70 homicides per 100,000 people. So it's a regional problem. And uh, what we are uh, what we are seeing is a change in the performance of the criminal organization. Why? They are looking for expansion on territorial terms. And with that expansion, which is a new factor of the crime, they are fighting each other, disputing territories. And what is the reason for that? One of those reasons is the organized crime in a region used to be only traffickers, only exporters, if I can say that, to the United States. And suddenly, they started a new part of the business, new division, and that division is retailing. And in order to retail, you need to organize a massive number of trucks. For instance, in order to pass one ton of cocaine from Mazatlan towards uh, Colorado or any border state, you need probably, I don't know, 50 people, 100 people, but think how many people you need in order to distribute and allocate the very same tons of cocaine in a small bags of one gram or less. So you need to distribute one million doses. Or in order to do that, you need to hire tremendous uh, troop in terms of people. And you need to expand your territory. And you need to control the territory, all the small stores and so on. So it's complex to do so. Those things are changing. Probably a lot of people will remember this era for that, but I believe that not all, but a lot of people will remember that this was the age, this was, these were the years in which Mexico started to change in terms of law enforcement and strong legal institutions. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. On behalf of everyone here, immense thanks for such a rich, thorough, and honest, and moving exposition. We cannot thank you enough. You have brought Mexico closer to us and to our hearts. And could we ask you all to please remain seated while the president and his uh, reserve company here uh, move out first, because we're going to go up the stairs. And you can, if you would like, to at least express one more time our appreciation through applause for the president. Yeah. The, the president wants to say one more word. I'm sorry, well, just a couple of words. I forgot to say, talking about the legacy, but I want to be remembered for my kids like a congressman a man who was able to live according to their ideals. And I say that because two days ago, I spoke to uh, a new generation of Marines in Mexico, and I told to these young people, by the way, one third of them women by first time, I told them, <laughs> uh, Live always honoring your name, which is going to be your one single valuable legacy to your kids. Your name and your country. And as I say, a lot of young people here, I will say you the same. Don't dare to live with ideals. Don't dare to live with ideals because the people who lose their ideals almost lose the mean of their life. So I expect to be remembered like a man of ideas and ideals. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. 
visit us at loc.gov.